Um, in the chat, I'm going to put the link to where the registration is. We're also putting all the recording links there as well. So um, you'll see the one from two weeks ago uh, on using a community practice framework. Uh, and Dave, you're kind of picking up the baton from where they left off at, uh, at UB and talking about using cohorts to do um, some training and professional development on your campus. So that's great. Um, so again, we're meeting every other week, uh, alternating Tuesday, Wednesday at 10. So the next one will be uh, two weeks on a Tuesday. Uh, and so, um, and the format uh, is, you know, uh, Dave's going to talk for about, you know, the first half hour-ish and take some questions and um, that'll probably bleed into the second hour, but second half hour. But um, if you have other questions or, or thoughts or concerns or anything that you'd like to talk about in the second half hour, um, you know, you could put those in the chat or uh, just bring them up uh, when we get to that point. Uh, and um, it's meant to be kind of an open time for us all to talk about issues that are on your mind. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Dave now and uh, thank him again for being here. Oh, thank you, Chris, for having me. Um, I'm going to share screen. I have a couple slides. That way you don't have to look at me and you can see some neat graphics and it'll be more ex explanatory uh, as I go. Um, I think that'll make things a little easier if I, oh, wow. Just give me a second here. That's... It's only at this point do I realize how many screens I have open. Let's see. And oops. Please forgive me. I'm experiencing technical difficulties. There we go. I'm going to presume that people are seeing right now the uh, slideshow. Is that correct? Yeah, looks good. Good, good. Just making sure. I have two screens and they're all bouncing around. So I wanted to make sure that you're looking at my email and uh, other panic uh, 29 of the browsers that are open. Um, the cohort training that we have, it originated. Um, we started off um, several years back. We won a Title III grant for the idea of improving student success. And it was a part of that. Um, originally, the people who wrote the grant um, just thought if we just train everyone in how to use the LMS, it would be a great option, right? But to me, it was an opportunity to make the training not about a learning management system, because those come and go, but principles of instructional design and getting faculty to discuss what works for them basically helps improve student success far better than someone knowing how to operate a tool in a learning management system. So I sort of morphed it into this instructional design uh, training that uh, that happens that would happen in an accelerated uh, two part course. And uh, let's see. Let's see. How are we doing? We're not moving forward. Somewhat embarrassing. Nothing. All right. Well, if you saw, you would see that there's a really cool. There we go. Got it. I'm looking over here is because my other monitor is over here to make sure I'm actually on the right slide. Uh, the uh, the goal effectively uh, was to improve the student success. I mentioned we really found that it was vastly successful during COVID because it prepared a lot of our students, probably a lot of our faculty to deal with online that wouldn't otherwise. In fact, we opened it up. It was originally meant for just faculty who are going to be developing or working uh, on an online course. And then we just said, since everyone's online, every faculty member needs to take this cohort training. Uh, the great part of this Title III grant that we found inspired a lot of faculty to complete the training was that part of the grant we put aside a stipend 
so that upon completion, the faculty actually got paid extra for their time. Um, interestingly enough, I found that that actually didn't work as much as I wanted to. Um, there are plenty of faculty who monetary uh, incentives were not enough to actually motivate them. So sometimes people say, if we just pay them more to do it, that's actually not one of the things. And I'll discuss that about options that we can do to sort of help motivate people for professional development, because that often is uh, a big issue. Um, one of the things too that we, I sort of smuggled within the cohort training was it wasn't just about training the, the faculty, but it was actually introducing OER content to them that they can use, especially OER tools to make their uh, teaching easier. So when I did that, and I'm sure many of you I see have probably seen me before, I have a sort of teaching style. I'm a strong believer in the idea of a micro lesson where you take little chunks of learning, no more than maybe four minutes in a video format uh, or a page and a half, and it's very condensed, but then you can put those micro trainings in various locations and allow the faculty or learners multiple forms of access. So whether or not they're accessing it through an OER content on a YouTube channel as a PDF mailed to them, they have the option to take it with them in any way. We found that relatively successful as some preferred to have a PDF handout, others preferred working in the LMS. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about the cohort training, but a lot of these micro lessons that are in the cohort training were also in the LMS and in an open blog, which you too can go check it out. I usually promote it, so I'll put it at the very end. Or you could just go to tinyurl.com backslash Dave Wolf Micro Lessons. Pretty easy to remember. Okay, so with the instructional design uh, cohort system, as I said, it was developed in a way that there's two parts. There's a part one, which would cover the theory and instructional design. And the second part was their application. So that besides just going over certain aspects of the training, we'd get that group of faculty to discuss those, those aspects they learned and then apply it. So the faculty would then have to create a course that they're gonna teach online and put the things that they learned in application. And the very end, what they got to do is share what they did and how they applied it. And then they had to comment on each other's work so we found that that sort of created this sort of community of learning so that they can say what works best for them. So they keep working back and forth and reviewing each other's ideas uh, because, you know, we find that that has a little more validity uh, when faculty manage to discuss things with each other. We also discovered that the, the adjuncts that were also invited into these cohort trainings very much like the, uh, the collegial atmosphere and they often felt this sort of, um, disjoint. They didn't really feel connected to the other faculty. And the fact that they could actually participate alongside the full-time faculty really made it easier for them both to understand certain issues, as well as in, get, offer insight to even the full-time faculty from what they're experiencing. So it worked out very well for us that way. Um, so the interesting thing about that, having to do the online cohorts, is I mentioned that we created a bunch of tools. One of those was we created a templated system, which I'll talk about a little later, that would assist the, the faculty in developing. And we discovered that by making the faculty take, when, well, when they take the course, by making them redesign their own online course, they would also bring it up to be reviewed through the Oscar review. And we discovered something very interesting that over the three years, and yeah, it's, it's a long thing to design a course and have it reviewed. So it's, I wish I could say we have a lot more development, but it takes a lot of work. We found a significant number of the courses that were developed would exceed all 50 OSCAR rubric standards when they take the course for, and they take the cohort. Okay, and when faculty were developing courses and they didn't take the cohort, then there was a significant drop in the course quality and they wouldn't meet all the standards. So I would highly suggest sort of enforcing this, everyone needs to be on the same page because you're gonna notice a jump in the 
course quality. And that in itself is going to increase student success. And what I like to try to, well, at least I always tell the faculty, you're going to learn strategies to making it easier for you to teach so that you can focus more on teaching and less on what I call administrivia, where you're trying to hunt down students and step them through where to, you know, where to, uh, to go to get the content or to do their assignments. We found that sh sharing instructional strategies in the cohort training was actually very useful for having them develop these strategies. Also, it's by no accident that the faculty who took the cohort training did so well, because literally the cohort training is designed around making them meet the Oscar rubric, right? It's, it's literally sort of like, as you're learning, it's like, you know, the next module, you're gonna learn about communication and all those little standards are smuggled in in little micro lessons for why they should do things, right? So that sort of helped them a lot. Uh, and the OER tools that we included was a real benefit because faculty all of a sudden realized that they didn't have to start from a blank slate. There's no tabula rasa when developing a course. You can create these sort of structures that are content free, but assist in developing significantly well-designed courses based on best practices of instructional design. Uh, in particular, we created what we call the course model. Nowadays, they call them templates, right? It is not anything to do about the content of the course, but it's all about how the course is structured. And by importing this model into your, your blank course shell, you are easily going to make 40% of the Oscar rubric standards because all you have to do, they have little sections, just type in your name, type in the little things you do, and you're already meeting those. And we found that the people who would adopt this course model, it was an option. Uh, I will soon have a paper coming out to press. Um, we discovered that faculty were nine and a half to 10 times more likely to develop a course that meets the Oscar rubric when they use a template like this, as opposed to going it alone. So really I try to tell people, don't go it alone. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Take a very developed template and adopt it and make it something that becomes standard across the college. And the other perk that we've discovered is the students themselves prefer the template because it's a uniform navigation. So that when one course applies the template and another one goes and does the template, students know where to go to find everything. And that of course has contributed to student success rates. So, if you're thinking about that, seriously think about the template. This is gonna be a little plug for when we move to Desire to Learn. Uh, there's actually a group working on a Desire to Learn template that's revolving around meeting the prints, uh, pardon me, meeting the standards of the Oscar rubric. So when, if you're a part of a college that's moving over, consider very strongly the having your faculty adopt this template when they're developing or develop your own, you'll discover a big boost in the, uh, in the Oscar uh, approval rating. Okay, they'll meet all the standards. Uh, the other things that we included in the uh, cohort that faculty had options to is we developed a bunch of uh, adaptive learning principle uh, tools so that effectively by uploading some of the tools into their course, there were certain adaptive commands that would basically find the students who are showing that they're having difficulty, possibly in doing discussion sections, in writing, and then it would send them to specially made instructional material that would help them so that we'd have no student left behind. And that way it becomes more of a personal learning experience. Uh, once COVID happened, uh, we decided to just make those videos that, uh, that we uh, included for the students to help them with discussion and for writing. And we made those OER material. Uh, you can go to the YouTube channel. You can include them in courses. Um, at this point, there's a lot of them uh, being viewed right now. Uh, these are the videos I, I mentioned. Uh, presently, there's over 18,000 views and the videos have been, been utilized in three different continents in different colleges. So just open for anyone to use because I'd rather have 
students use them somewhere, even in you know uh, Australia, than not being used at all. And of course, you're welcome to do that too. The other feature about the cohort training, and this is where I kind of smuggle things in because originally, you know, it was conceived of as just learning how to use Blackboard or how to use the LMS, is that we literally, when we're talking about course design, we brought in issues of accessibility as well as issues of um, universal design for learning principles. Now, we can't cover everything there is, especially about the latter. That's a huge, huge topic, right? So if you are interested in that, I highly recommend that you take a course on it. You can study it. But introducing the, stu uh, pardon me, the students, the faculty, to the instructional design uh, principles underlying universal design for learning, as well as the importance of accessible documents, accessible images, accessible tables, what it means to be Y cage compliant and where to go to even check those things for materials. And we use Blackboard Ally. If you don't use Blackboard Ally, it doesn't necessarily require that you use Blackboard. It is agnostic on LMS. It is great at running reports and assisting faculty to make sure that all their content is accessible. So we really work hard at getting this, the faculty to develop um, their online material to be accessible. And we've noticed that since we've done the cohort training and we utilize this, uh, we've gradually been getting better and better with accessible ratings, uh, both with our images and with the documents. And we also smuggled in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because a lot of times we would find that there are new faculty and they would you know, be channeled in sort of the, the thing we tell all the deans is tell all the new faculty, you are taking the cohort, right? Um, and within the first unit, we really introduce the, the faculty to what it's like to be one of our students. We have some very interesting issues about our students. We're a community college. The average age of a part-time student is 31 years old, uh, at least one in three have children. These are all issues that people don't think of as traditional students, right? They have lots of issues that you don't think about. Uh, we even have um, a food pantry because we noticed that a lot of our students were suffering from issues of hunger. And when we meet those things, their grades get better, right? So we sort of bring these issues to the forefront and we sort of push strategies to have more equitable environments for learning. And this is a great opportunity to do it. Instead of just teaching them how to design, how to put content into a learning management system, instead, it's how to ethically develop a course in the learning management system so that it's equitable for everybody. And we've noticed that we've actually spurred a lot of interest uh, in that, uh, in the first chapter alone, and then weaved throughout the entire uh, cohort section. Uh, we're developing more training for that, but at least it starts people off on a ground where they can start thinking of these issues where many of them did not. Um, in particular, the adjuncts. When we hire adjuncts, a lot of times they're not aware of the, st the student demographics, how many students we have who may be first generation students and or um, students with disabilities which I believe right now for our college is around 24%. So it's almost one in four. So you have to think about these things. What are the factors that they are struggling with? And when you're designing a course, are you really accommodating those or you're making barriers that make it harder for them? So that would be the thing that we sort of patched in there. And that is pretty much it. The other factor is I'm always recruiting people to do the cohort, which was significantly easier when there was a thousand dollars or more stipend if they could finish it and develop the course. But as the grant runs out, it's a little harder. But we've also discovered that faculty have so much, especially during COVID, that that wasn't even enough. Really people's time is. And I think one of the issues is that when it comes to professional development, we don't quantify the amount of hours of what people do as much. So it doesn't show up in many ways for 
review for tenure or other ways that can be measured. So that's another thing we should th sort of think about. But by in basically making it part of the process of a college, by, for, for example, uh, just last semester, we worked with the uh, provost here, and it's now, if you are a new faculty, you have to take the cohort training. It's just part of first semester, this is what you do. I've discovered that there's a little bit of animosity because people now view it as something they have to do instead of something they chose to do or something they're rewarded to do. So that's where I come up with the idea that we maybe need to find a way of badging or some way of making it so that they can put it on their review, if you will, so that when they're being reviewed for, for tenure or so, they can demonstrate so many hours of professional development to show that commitment to issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility issues, and instructional design that will improve student success. Um, the other issue that I often point out is, I always use these little QR codes and I always <laughs> meet with faculty any which way I can. And when I do that, I do that specifically so that I um, so that I can um, show them the QR code, the URL that they can access at any time, so that if they don't go into their courses or so, they can still sort of browse those lessons. And that I found increases the hits because I make these sort of micro lessons, and they can search on a blog to get the answer to what they want. And then they sort of get stuck in the rabbit hole and start learning more. And anytime I can do that, that sort of generates um, better, better behavior. Okay, so is there a way to unpause? Mm. Oh, yeah, well, Dave, uh, Dave, anybody questions for Dave? about his cohort training for course design. Feel free to just jump in to smallish group or use the chat if you prefer. So I, I like uh, your point, Dave, about bringing the adjuncts in. I mean, when we did some of this kind of cohort faculty cohorts for online course design back when we had actually some money for it uh, and some interest among the college um, it was actually a number of our our adjuncts that were involved because a lot of this was coming out of our liberal studies and continuing ed, ed program and and just have a just have a, a space where adjuncts could talk with other faculty about their teaching was probably as important as what, what we talked about in terms of online course design. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that when we run the cohorts, um, you know, we run it just like a class. We have a sort of like, you know, the icebreaker discussion, get them to know each other and what, you know, areas they're, they're teaching. But we put in a non-term section and we let them know that all that content they can access whenever. So after they finish the cohort, they can always go back. So if they ever thought, gee, you know, I, I remember in the cohort, they had a, an already made rubric that you can upload into your, uh, into your course for, you know, grading discussions. So I don't have to create my own. They could just go back and do it. And we noticed that occasionally we do have faculty who revisit for those things. Um, I like to think of them as little Easter eggs, right? Instead of just making it something they have to teach, give them something to go back for. Like there's a, a pre-made student survey that teaches you about their reactions, you know, about uh, how they preferred a model, uh, a module, what they liked about it, you know, what helps them. And that effectively then makes them go back because they know they're gonna take things from the course and save them time. It's sort of bribery, I think, but it works, right? It's pre-made stuff that makes it easy for them. They love, right? Here's a pre-made instructor page that, you know, you just change your name, put a couple sentences in, change the image, you're good, right? They love that because they don't have to work as much. Um, even a script for an intro video helps a lot. Uh, I see in the chat, someone asked, what learning management system am I currently using? I don't know if that's me, but I'm using Blackboard 9.1, which is 
I like to liken that to, you know, the 1991 rusted out Toyota Tercel of cars, right? It may have been great in 91, but right now it's, it's antiquated and, uh, you know, you can't get any parts for it. So in that sense, I'm looking forward to moving towards desire to learn. Um, I use that metaphor, by the way, with faculty, because often they're nervous about changing. And I say, well, now you're going to get a 2022 Honda Civic. And you're going to notice it's going to have a whole bunch of new features that you will like, right? So it's going to make it easier for you, I suppose, is something you have to struggle with. Uh, is there one template for them to choose from? Uh, and what is preloaded? Um, interesting question. Um, there is only one course model that we created that they can preload, that they can load. It's just a package that they can load in, but it's a very developed package, all right? I mean, there are so many optional features that they can have. For example, inside that course model, we have a section where we embed uh, a chat session for 24 seven chat sessions with uh, librarians from across the country. Right, so students have the access for a library chat instantaneously. You might not want that if you're teaching calculus and you don't think it's necessary. I don't know why I would keep it anyway, but you know, we include all these little you know, options that are modifiable. I find that sometimes having the one is easier than trying to get them to choose multiple. Then you have to have them waver back and forth and uh, they might not choose any. So I'm just scanning the chat here. Um, yeah, Dave, I may, I may have missed this because I was doing some multitasking. That's perfectly acceptable. I do the same. But uh, a little bit about the logistics of your cohort model. I mean, when we ran our cohorts, uh, it was back before we had faculty with all of this experience with remote emergency, mm -hmm. remote instruction, and so forth. So we would have um, like four face-to-face -face meetings on like a Saturday morning or something to you know, go through chunks. Mm -hmm. And then they would have work to do in between. It's a fairly substantial investment. Uh, what, what, what sort of uh, time commitment do you have for your faculty when they go through the cohorts? I mean, I, I, how, how long, how many modules? Um, a lot. No, <laughs> not lie. Yeah. in fact, I'd, I'd like to start creating uh, a diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, separate training, right? And, you know, because it all is, here's an intro, but there's so much more. And I don't want to just keep jamming it in because there's so much to be learned, right? But when I developed it, I developed it in a two-part section so that they can take a break because it's intense, right? So it's like, here, you learned a lot. Now take like you know a four week break and we go back right and originally it was designed so that it was at least um, meeting the requirements of a three credit hour course so it'd be like taking a three credit hour graduate course you put in a lot of time into it um, I then made it uh, we found that adjuncts couldn't come during the week to take these classes so we made an online version over the summer. So that we have, you know, even online instructors who are not even in the area could take that. And that was two six-week sessions that's condensed. And the first, the first session has seven modules, but really two modules are very short. So it's almost like a module a week, right? And uh, the other one only has four modules and some of the modules span the week. But th that, the second part is a lot about them getting their course reviewed after they've developed it and then redeveloping it and discussing what they did. And so there's a lot of work that goes in, into that second part. It's not as much as them just learning directly and discussing strategies. It's actually, here's what I did. Here's peer review of, of it. And then, you know, how can we make it better? So it's a pretty it's a significant investment of time then. And it's, it's oh, yeah. uh, interesting that you've been able to you know, make it a, an expectation of, of new incoming faculty. <laughs> nice. Yeah, not the money. The money, though, it did work. They love to hear that. They're always like the first day. What's the stipend? How do I get it? Right. I'm like, slow down. 
It's like a grant. You got to fill out a million forms. <laughs> it's a lot of administration going on here, more than an Eastern European country, and then maybe we'll get you the money as soon as we can. Don't don't hold it to me, right? But yeah, as I said, unless we unless we score another grant, it's kind of hard to to yep. compensate them. And I do believe they should be compensated because it is difficult. But I try to remind faculty that this type of learning, if you were to go for professional development in this material, you would easily be paying thousands of dollars. So you know, try to remind them of that. That's that sort of you know raises some eyebrows. We do have some high school teachers who teach calculus, for example, as an adjunct. Um, they were actually getting credit for professional development for taking this right. and getting you know, so there are ways of sort of thinking outside the box. The fact that you can show that this course is like a three credit hour graduate class. That's enough to, to encourage, you know, extra workplaces and all the chip in and uh, reward them for that work. And we try to give them a little certificate at the end. I mean, I'm not sure if that really, you know, goes up on the walls or anything, but it's something that shows that they've done it. Laura's got a question. Yes, Laura. Hi, Dave. Thanks for your presentation. Really helpful to see. I'm always curious to know what other SUNY campuses are doing in terms of training faculty on UDL and mm -hmm. accessibility. Um, here at Fredonia, we just turned on Ally in the fall 2021 for all courses. So Lisa and I are still working on how we're gonna roll out training mm -hmm. for Ally. You know, we've been catching people like one-on-one -on -one when they're coming to us with a question. It like provides that opportunity to look in their course and say, oh, by the way, I see your yeah. syllabus is flagged as red. Can we have a conversation about that? Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know how you approached that training for Ally, right? Like how how do you how do you catch everybody, right? Well, it sort of seems like a daunting task. Like how you do know, you? Draw I in wish everybody? I could say I'd be lying right. if I say you know you know what we yeah. have every document is perfect here. No, no. In fact, it, um, it, it kills me because you know it's like holding the ocean back with a broom. Every time you hire new adjuncts. They just upload hundreds of documents and you're like, no, you know, and I, I have a little saying that says, uh, you know, adopt kittens, not inaccessible publisher content, because there's a lot of publishers out there who have inaccessible content. So yes, that's, that's actually, I have a little meme I created in the cohort. And I like that. Discussion I like about that. that. Right. So yeah, that this is not an easy task. And I always joke around that I want to do a shaming board, right? <laughs> like, you know, these are the 10 worst classes by these people, right? <laughs> Posted right. everywhere, you know, right. and, you know, try to shame them. But, uh, you know, it probably won't work hiring a woman to ring a bell and yell shame behind them as they go. That's probably not gonna be successful. So instead I try to encourage people to work on it. And one thing I found very encouraging is that I created this video about how to do accessible images in Blackboard. Mm. And one of the things I did was I literally showed, I recorded, I took a recording of what it sounds like when a JAWS reader reads an untagged image. Mm. and it's god awful right it, it creates anxiety right and, and then you realize this is what's happening every time you don't do this in your course that has 90 images this is what's happening right and that in itself is something that you know when when a faculty member hears that that's like their epiphany and like you know what all i got to do is click on li the red thing and type in a description mm -hmm. and save and i'm done and like yes and then they love it, right? And they, they're willing to adopt it. The hardest thing is they said, getting them on board. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm always doing, I just did a webinar on accessible tables and accessible images. It, you know, it's something that, you know, I could literally create a career out of. I feel like they just go campus to campus giving, you know, talks if they would pay me because there's always gonna be a need. I wish that wasn't the case, right? But right, that's it. Right. I do find, what we did also with allies, instead of thinking of it as just something that'll help make documents accessible, it also makes content accessible for students. Mm -hmm. So I've created a PDF with uh, a video showing how to download and images, how to download the alternate content. Mm -hmm. Because uh, many people don't realize you don't have to have a disability to take advantage of the fact that you could download content in MP3 format so you can listen to it on your phone. 
right? It didn't, you know, I know there's always those academics who you'll be like, well, you have to read the text. It's like, yeah, that's fine. Maybe they read it once, but they want to listen to it while waiting for the bus and they don't have a computer screen or something to do that, right? There are so many opportunities here that they can hear it over and over again while they decide to jog around a the track. They can take advantage of that. And just like those people who English is not their natural language, there's that option to download it in, I believe, over 70 languages. And we've done just this past year, we've had several students, uh, we have helped with that. So, you know, I don't think they're cheating when they want to be able to have, you know, the syllabus in Spanish. And it's, the translation is not good enough to pass a Spanish one exam. So it's not like, you know, wow, they're going to cheat. No, they're not. You're just helping them right? They need the most help. So I find that when we send that out and we keep reminding faculty to remind their students about one of the features besides making sure your content is accessible is this, then you kind of keep reminding them that it's there. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, you're very hard to be vigilant. So don't yeah, be depressed thanks. your first semester. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah, at Fredonia, we're, we're discovering that it's it's gonna it's gonna be something that's more like a culture shift, right? Yeah. And teaching individuals how to work differently, right? Mm -hmm. Not not more, right? I think like yeah. the initial inclination by some instructors is, oh, it's gonna create more work for me. No, we just have to approach it differently. So yes. so for us, we're still in that stage of one, you know, number one, raising awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, that accessibility report link in your course, you should actually click on it, right? It's like getting people. Uh -huh first to that point where they're clicking on the report and mm -hmm. you know and then i guess the second follow up part's going to be okay please come to our workshops we're here to help you like navigate when you yeah. open up that accessibility report which can be overwhelming right like where mm -hmm. where do they start right so yeah. it's a I journey like we're telling people it's a journey right yeah. we don't expect a 100% score like out of the starting gate i like to remind people too that when they're driving in their new car and a red oil light blinks on do you just ignore it no right you, you at least right. want to know what that light is right i mean you right. should at least you know look at it figure out oh that's the oil it needs oil at least you know that with ally if you don't know what that red thing is you should click on it to see right. what is that right? right and that will explain it right so mm -hmm. they really need to be a little more Mm -hmm. intuitive about these types mm -hmm. of things so i try mm -hmm. to remind them that, that those are those are warning gauges you know if mm -hmm. someone's warning you of something you should be you know a little more uh, situational awareness of your course might help mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and uh, you, you're right, welcome you, to right. use that metaphor of the red light blinking on your dashboard i like that yeah so. and, and don't ignore when there's these red dials in your course right yes. i mean i think that's the point we're at where it's like you can't ignore it like it's your syllabus and your course readings all have red dials right so we're that's mm -hmm. what we're advising folks to start like make sure your syllabus is, is accessible and all your required readings as yes. a place to start so. and something to note too that in the newer versions of blackboard even though ours is so antiquated there's like mothballs on it right yeah there is a little accessibility checking feature so oh, in the yeah, table, yeah. you can press it and it will assist you and this yeah. is the same and even better in d2l so yeah. just making so, it a point of when you're finishing click the button finish it up and go and there's this thing called the accessibility checker in microsoft products oh it's yeah amazing. yeah We're the yeah, fact our, that it takes two minutes to click and read yeah. and do, you know, yeah. I just say, do you want to be the type of person who looks like they don't know what they're doing as an academic? You want to look like you know what you're doing. So mm -hmm. learn to use headings. And the cool thing about learning to use headings is you can make um, table of contents is very easily, mm -hmm. right? It's all automatically done. And if you want to save it as a PDF with hyperlinks in it and all, it's great. And then people think that you are, you know, really good, right? It raises their you know, their opinion of you. And that's, right. that's good professionally, right? So I try to remind faculty about that. Right? Thank so, you. So, uh, what do we have over here in the chat? Da, da, da. Oh, I was just plugging your course, Dave. Uh, oh. So Dave, some of you now know, all of you now know, Dave teaches a uh, course for us on universal design for learning for faculty and part of our- Which is a lot more detailed than our cohort. Right. Yeah, well, it's part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion in teaching and learning yeah. certificate program. Um, to find more information on the page. Well, thank you for that, Dan. Yeah. A, I would like to think it's a good course. It's something to think about often and often when I'm dealing with faculty or administrators, they think of, 
uh, universal design for learning as equivalent to accessibility or that it's just one or two little things. And it's actually an incredibly developed theory that gives you insight and guidelines to help teaching in many different levels. So I think, you know, what happens is people undersell it instead of investigating how like, they can utilize it to make their courses more effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, the other thing I wanted to say too is I really appreciated your point about, you know, yeah, we, it's really easy to fall into that kind of uh, place of not just you're, as a trainer, as someone as a, uh, a professional developer, to you know want to shame people into doing the right thing. But I think people, I think one of the challenges of doing diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility kind of training is that people already come to it in a place of feeling ashamed that they don't know all that they think they should know. So, and then I think the reaction most people have in those circumstances is to just bury their head in the sand. <laughs> and just pretend like it doesn't exist. And so I really liked your, you know, your example of the, sh the best thing to do in that case is not to sort of further the shame, it's to educate people about what it's like to experience lack of accessibility or lack of inclusion. Mm -hmm. And that's the, I think, the best way to motivate folks and not to make them feel further ashamed about not knowing something they don't know. Um, and, I, you know, so uh, I'm glad that you, you provide that example, Dave. Thank yeah, you. well, it's really the only way to go. And I mean, I'm I'm very sympathetic to faculty. I mean, there's been a lot, especially with the, the lockdown and the, the huge having to work online where many didn't want to do that. Now we have to pick up tools. That's a lot of extra work. They have a lot on their plate, especially at a research institution. There's not a lot of um, feedback and mechanisms to reward caring. I know that sounds very strange, right? But that's always been a complaint, about, especially at research institutions. They don't focus on teaching because teaching isn't the focus of getting tenure, right? So, you know, sometimes we have to think about how we're gonna address that, right? We have to look at the feedback mechanisms and maybe make some structural changes that would help them or at least reduce their load, right? And recognize that this is work to learn principles of teaching instructional design. So if we can reduce their load while they're doing that, the college itself is going to notice higher student success rates, higher retention rates. These things are what they want, right? So when they're talking about they don't have the money to reduce load to do these things, I often try to point out, you don't have the money not to, right? I mean, it's an investment in the future of the college. And that's, that's big. Uh, in the chat, too, sure he has an invitation to folks if they want to Come together and build a uh, inclusivity uh, course on help and you know designing inclusive courses. Uh, so you can all read what Sheree put in the chat there. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Sheree. I would love to if I could manage to get past May. <laughs> We're in cohort one, so all the courses are going to be converted over plus my work. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, I totally understand what Dave says, where you create these modules and then you're like, oh, my God, I need to add this and this should be there, too. So if the basic course that we have could like just sort of allude to and there's this other course that you could take that has more. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like I could see doing one of these for assessment, like a big full blown seven week assessment course. Mm -hmm. And because ours are broken up into um like an introduction to teaching online and good teaching practices, and then how to organize your course, making things accessible, assessments, um, where you get your engaging course content from, and then like building online communities in the discussion. And then we also have like an inclusive um, classroom now as well. And I can see inclusive classroom becoming its own seven week thing. And I can see accessibility becoming several weeks. So if anybody is interested, email me. I'll send my email and then come May, I will um, try to get something started. I'll probably and we, we can do it in Brightspace too. Okay. And even if you even if you don't have yeah. Brightspace, I think I can get our admin to give you a Brightspace account. Um, temporarily so that we could build it. And then once everybody has bright space, you can just take a copy of the course and mm -hmm. make any changes you need. No. And that's so, uh, yeah, after you. No, no, go ahead, Dave. That's something that I mentioned, a lot of the micro lessons I do, 
the assessments, the assignments that I keep as part of the cohort and it's not available freely, right? Because quite frankly, the college has invested a lot in it, but a lot of times the little training sessions that I make these little micro lessons with the accompanying video and stuff, um, I usually make that OER, right? So you're welcome to take, if you notice my blog, you're welcome to take it, utilize it, embed the videos, share them, you know, um, same thing about if we want to develop an inclusive training course, if that's something that, you know, you want to do as long as it's uh, creative commons, right? The idea is we're all in this together and, uh, you know, I'll be just happy if people learn the material. Uh, I'm not know, a good if, that way. <laughs> and if, 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 you know, if you have folks who want deeper dives and you have the funding for it, I mean, that's what we have our CPD yeah. courses for. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I know that not all campuses have the resources to invest in that for faculty. Um, yeah. You know, we do obviously charge for our courses, but for SUNY CPD member campuses, both the DEI, the DEI certificate, we have an assessment one that we've had for our assessment of student learning one for a while. It's, it's a little over $705 for all three courses for one faculty member to go through. And interestingly enough, they are kind of, we describe them as graduate courses, although, you know, they definitely don't take as long, but there are usually three courses uh, to earn a certificate, six weeks each, and we say two to four hours per course. So, you know, if you do the math, it's a little over 50 hours for uh, someone to, but it's a deep dive. It really, you know, those who complete our certificates, I think, you know, get that kind of, um, you know, learn, you know, they go into a lot more detail than you would necessarily, you don't need, that's not for everybody is what I'm saying, you know? I mean, yeah. sometimes, you know, you just gotta get people, you know, what they need and then that's it and they don't have time for anything more than that but you know some faculty really want you know go a little further so ellen asked about the speaking of bright space ellen asked about the, the the migration from you know blackboard to uh bright space and i'm just going to put again the link to the um ple migration website that has all the updates i mean i'm not on the peripheries necessarily but i you know my colleague jamie heron at the cpd is the one who's leading the at least the training initial part of that initiative and right now there are two committees working dave mentioned there's one working on the templates that we're going to um provide to campuses uh that will be part of the training as well and so that work has to be done first before the training gets put out there um and and there's actually there's been some some delays as there are always is with these sort of initiatives. Uh, so the training hasn't really been scheduled yet. However, you may have seen there are, um, Jamie has organized what she's calling uh, uh, DLE Brightspace Fireside Chats. There's actually the first one today, yeah. this afternoon. So I'm putting the link in the chat there. And really what that's meant to do is to kind of, um, in lieu of the actual former training have, being scheduled yet, Jamie just wanted to have these check-ins to introduce people to who's gonna be doing the training, outline the plans, um, and just kind of give uh, everyone a, a chance to kind of touch base around, you know, because uh, everyone's very anxious, I know, those of you who are in the first cohort uh, are anxious to, you know, get going. So that's today, that's this afternoon. Um, I believe if you register, uh, you should be able to get, you know, the link to, to, to be able to attend this afternoon at three o'clock. Um, and, you know, uh, we will have a session. I invited Jamie to come to one of these sessions in April. Uh, so Jamie, at that time, you know, we'll probably have all the training mapped out. And so, you know, you, I wanted her to come later, but there'll be, you know, lots of information going on about this. But if you sign up for that fireside chat today, you'll get the latest and greatest about what uh, we know now about this. Yeah, and I think it's going to be, you know, you're right about Blackboard. It's, 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 the 90, I had a 91 Toyota Tercel actually. Right. It, lasted, it lasted, you know, pretty good. But, you it's know, I, I had my wife at the time. Well, she was my wife at the time, but she, I was in Albany. She was in uh, uh, UMass Amherst and I had to drive on 90. And then coming back one time, going up that hill in the Berkshires, it just, it just, <laughs> so I think that's where we're at with Blackboard right now. It's going up the hill in the Berkshires and it's about. Yeah, we're, we're pushing it beyond its limits at this point. <laughs> It's no longer going to be supported. It's just outdated. You know, it's like we're running Windows Vista and wondering why, you know, we're having a hard time viewing web pages, right? So, you know, we'll, we'll move forward. I am excited about, you know, everyone's worried about what to tell faculty too. The idea 
that we're centralizing it as a digital learning environment. So that instead of having all these individual instructional designers all have to worry about taking, it's all centralized, right? The training will be in one place. We'll have training for students in one place. It's gonna save a lot of duplication. And hopefully it'll give us a lot more buying power, right? When multiple schools decide to pitch in for a tool, that's going to help, you know, lower the price and make it more affordable for our schools. And, you know, speaking from a community college, that's a big deal. So anybody have any other questions or concerns, um, issues they'd like to bring up? We have a couple more minutes if you do. getting my coffee all right well if not then um i'll let you all go thank you dave for a great session uh again the the uh link to uh the recording will be uh, available on the website which i'll throw in the chat one more time here and our next meeting as i said will be in two weeks on uh tuesday march 8th uh Rhea Nowak from SUNY Oneonta will talk about her new faculty orientation program that they have at Oneonta. So hope to see you all then. Uh, until that time, hopefully it'll be a little warmer then. We won't be looking at a snowstorm right in front of us, but uh, you know, hopefully you all uh, are safe and sound and uh, we'll see you hopefully in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. All right, thanks Dave.